Hello and welcome to the workshop, Extracorporeal Photopheresis, or ECP, a treatment for some patients with graft versus host disease. My name is John Stowali, and I'll be your moderator today. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Mali Galigli. Dr. Galigli is Assistant Professor in the Department of Medicine and a member of the Immune Oncology Program at University Hospital Seidman Cancer Center in Cleveland, Ohio. Dr. Galigli spearheaded and serves as the director of a multidisciplinary graft versus host disease, or GVHD, outpatient clinic, which provides focused care and offers clinical trial enrollment to patients with GVHD. She is currently investigating the efficiency of two cellular therapies, extracorporeal photophoresis, or ECP, and mesenchymal stem cell infusion to treat steroid refractory and high-risk GVHD. Oh, join me in welcoming Dr. Galogli. All right. Thanks so much. Um, I wanted to thank BMT Infonet for inviting me to speak, and thank you all for being here. Um, just to say a little bit more about Seidman, um, the cancer center that I work in is affiliated with University Hospitals in Cleveland, Ohio, and as part of the Keys Comprehensive Cancer Center. At Seidman, we do about 50 allo transplants per year and over 100 total cell therapy infusions per year. And um, as John mentioned, I run a specialized clinic focused on the evaluation and treatment of GVHD with my nurse practitioner colleague, Linda Baer. And today I'll be focusing on extracorporeal photophoresis, or ECP, for the treatment of graft-versus-host disease. So uh, my hope is that during this talk, we'll uh, review how ECP works to understand how it differs from other treatments for graft-versus-host disease and identify who might benefit from ECP. Um, we'll start doing that by reviewing how graft-versus-host disease develops. We'll review the usual approach to graft-versus-host disease treatment and see where ECP fits in. And then we'll talk more specifically about how ECP works and the pros and cons of ECP treatment. So I always like to review how GVHD works before talking about GVHD treatment. And understanding GVHD requires understanding of the bone marrow and how it's affected by stem cell transplantation. So the bone marrow serves as a factory for our circulating blood cells, the red cells, the white cells, and the platelets that are shown in the figure. All these cells that circulate in our bloodstream developed from stem cells, which live and stay in the bone marrow. I think of stem cells like a version 1.0 of every blood cell. They serve as the basic model blood cell that can then specialize into becoming a grown-up red cell, white cell, or platelet. So when a transplant is performed, strong chemotherapy kills the stem cells that a patient is born with. And this can be beneficial because that strong chemotherapy is also capable of killing any leftover blood cancer cells that might be residing in the marrow. But unfortunately, it destroys the bone marrow supply of healthy stem cells. So for patients who get a transplant to treat a blood cancer and they get their cells from a donor that is not themselves, the donor cells have two jobs. One is to repopulate the empty bone marrow. And the second is to use its new immune cells to protect against the blood cancer relapse. And I'm going to explain that in a little more detail in the next couple of slides. So this picture shows how the immune cells from the donor, which are shown in green, can attack a recipient's cancer cell in pink. So a specific type of white blood cell from the donor, which is called T cells, or the green cell, um, they're able to recognize differences between themselves and the recipient cells. And when those recipient cells are cancer cells, like the pink cell, the donor immune cell can destroy them, and that can basically um, prevent relapse of the blood cancer. Unfortunately, the recipient's own immune cells, which are shown in blue, do not have that same ability. In an ideal world, donor T cells are only supposed to destroy 
cancer cells from the recipient. They should not attack the recipient's normal cells, which are shown here in blue, who happen to be innocent bystanders in this process. However, if the donor T cells do attack the recipient's healthy tissues and organs, that is a situation called graft-versus-host disease. So as you may be aware, graft-versus-host disease can occur at any time after stem cells engraft, which means they enter the bone marrow and start to grow. Uh, in general, graft-versus-host disease that occurs within the first 100 days of transplant is considered acute, um, and it primarily involves the skin, the stomach, the intestines, or the liver. On the other hand, graft-versus-host disease that occurs after 100 days is generally referred to as chronic, and it affects many more organ systems as shown in the figure. And this may include uh, the mouth, the eyes, the lungs, uh, the musculoskeletal system, um, even the blood cells themselves. So um, all patients who receive their stem cells from another person uh, receive some kind of intervention to prevent graft-versus-host disease, either a medication or the cells themselves are manipulated before they're given to the patient. The prevention um, intervention is called prophylaxis, and some of the common medications that are used for graft-versus-host disease prophylaxis um, are shown at the bottom of this pyramid in the dark blue. If graft-versus-host disease develops despite the prophylaxis, we generally add steroids. And depending on the severity of the GVHD symptoms, uh, we might add just a topical steroid, like a, a steroid cream to the skin, or we might do pills like prednisone, or we may give IV infusions like methylprednisolone. So the steroids come in multiple formulations. If the graft-versus-host disease symptoms do not improve with steroids, or if they recur while the steroids are being lowered or tapered, um, then we will add what we call a second-line treatment. There are three current FDA-approved medications to treat steroid refractory graft-versus-host disease. Um, there's one for acute GVHD and three for chronic GVHD. In general, the FDA-approved agents are used at first after steroids. And if those second-line agents don't work or a patient doesn't tolerate them, um, then many other treatments may be considered. Uh, and one of those many treatments is ECP. So let's talk about ECP. We can kind of break it down. Um, we can break down the words to get the meaning. So extra means outside. Corporeal means the body. Photo refers to light. And phoresis is an actual procedure where blood is removed from the body, it's manipulated, and then it's returned to the body again. So if we had to define ECP, we could say it's a light therapy that's performed on blood cells that are removed from the body and then returned. So how does ECP work? Um, a patient is connected to a special machine called an apheresis machine, and that connection can be through a regular IV in their arm, or they may be connected through a special port. Um, when the phoresis procedure starts, whole blood is removed from the patient, and then the blood cells themselves are separated. So um, in particular, there's a special population of white cells, which includes the T cells, which we talked about earlier, those cells are kind of pulled and removed from the rest of the blood, and the rest of the blood gets returned to the patient. So these immune cells that have been separated out um, are then incubated with a light sensitizer, and that's a chemical called methoxysorlin. And then the blood sensitizer mixture is exposed to ultraviolet A light. This damages the, um, the DNA of the cells. And the treated blood cells are returned to the patient through either another IV in the other arm or the same port. So our current understanding of ECP is not perfect, and we only understand some of the ways that it helps to stop the inflammation in graft-versus-host disease. In the big picture, it stops the war of the donor immune cells on the healthy recipient organs. 
Um, in the more detailed picture, research has shown that it does that in multiple ways. One is that it changes the levels of chemicals called cytokines that can increase inflammation. It also changes the balance of um, immune cells that contribute to graft-versus-host disease compared to the immune cells that are what we call tolerant, which means they kind of make peace between themselves and the recipient. So um, the immune cells that contribute to the inflammation, those levels go down. And the immune cells that uh, make peace with the recipient, those increase. And overall, the balance goes more towards tolerance than inflammation. So is extracorporeal photophoresis effective? Um, that question is hard to answer precisely. And that's because studies that are published on ECP um, can be difficult to apply to all GVHD patients. Um, and there are several reasons. Um, one is that the studies are small. The largest ones may be with 50 to 150 patients, but most of them are smaller, maybe 20 to 30 patients. Um, there's always variation in the patients who are included, um, and that might be their disease, um, their cancer that they had originally, what type of transplant they had, what kind of graft versus host disease prophylaxis they received, um, and how far out they are uh, from transplant, and what they might have already received for their graft versus host disease treatment. So it's a very um, mixed population of, of patients. Um, another is that ECP schedules vary according to different centers. So some patients would receive it twice a week, some three times a week, um, some two days in a row, some more spread out. Um, and many of these studies don't compare ECP to another treatment, which makes it hard to know how it stacks up against other things. Um, and then finally, most of these studies are retrospective in nature, which means that they were done by looking back at data that was collected over patients who already received the intervention. And the best quality studies for predicting how um, certain treatments will affect patients in the future, those are designed where the treatment plan is our, is made before the study is done, and then you go the patients through the treatment plan and um, and look at their results that way. It's just a better quality study. So although the studies are imperfect, um, there are several publications that exist on ECP treatment. Um, in general, for acute GVHD, the reported response rates are about 60% and higher. The best responses tend to occur in patients who have involvement of the skin. And in one study, starting the ECP earlier after the diagnosis of steroid refractory acute GVHD was a little bit um, more effective than starting later. So patients who started two weeks after versus three weeks after um, had a little bit better responses. In chronic graft versus host disease, the reported response rates are a bit lower and more variable from about a third to three quarters. Um, among patients with graft versus host disease that's chronic, the better responses occurred in patients who have uh, skin involvement, oral cavity involvement, or GI or liver involvement. This is not to say that someone with lung GVHD, for example, could not still benefit from ECP. It's just that, um, you know, among patients with all those different organ functions that are affected, the ones who responded best happen to have those organs, um, those organ manifestations. So really, um, how helpful ECP could be for you um, is a very, um, it can be sort of a tricky assessment that depends on publications, depends on um, other factors about you and what the transplant center may have available. So your care team can probably compare ECP to other therapies and their pros and cons to predict what treatment has the best balance of risks and benefits for you. So how does this actually work for a patient? Like, what is their experience like? So the treatment schedule of ECP, um, the most standard one is a twice-a-week schedule, although in a few studies, um, there are three times a week schedules that have been published. Um, sometimes those twice-a-week visits are two days in a row, and sometimes they're spread through the week to make things easier for the patient. So something like a Monday, Thursday, or a Tuesday, Friday. Uh, once a patient has um, a stable response or some improvement um, in their symptoms, then we start to decrease the frequency of the ECP. Uh, we go to weekly and then every two weeks and then stop. 
um, probably every center has its own specific way of tapering down the ECP appointments. Um, in a typical appointment, it does take a lot of the day. So patients will come in, uh, get their vital signs taken and their labs drawn um, because sometimes in order to proceed with ECP, um, they may need an infusion of electrolytes or may need a blood transfusion. There are um, parameters for the safety of ECP that do require a certain um, red cell and platelet level. Usually that does not keep patients from receiving it if their counts are low because we can give them transfusions ahead of time. But we always want to make sure that um, the patients meet criteria to treat before we start the procedure. Um, then they need their IV access established. So again, some patients can just use their regular veins, uh, their peripheral IVs to do the ECP and others cannot and then they need a special port. Um, this is different from a meta port. Unfortunately, um, it's a special port uh, called a power port that can withstand the pressure changes of the apheresis machine. So then IV access has to be established, and then if the patient ends up needing electrolytes or transfusions, we do that first. And then there's the ECP procedure itself, which can take up to a couple of hours. So um, that ends up taking most of the day for most patients. In terms of how long does the treatment last, um, it could be for months to even years, depending on how helpful it is. So if it works great, it may be um, tapered over uh, a couple of months once it starts to help, and it can take weeks to make symptoms better. So you add up the weeks to make things better, and then a little bit of time for stable symptoms, and then several more weeks to wean off, and you're, you're already at months, and that's even if it works well. Um, if it's not working great, we'll sometimes try to give it its best shot and really do for a couple months um, to really make sure that we tried. And then if that doesn't work well, we may taper it off and try something different. For some patients who found it very helpful, they like to kind of stay on even every two weeks or so, um, just hoping that it's still adding a little bit to, the, to keeping their symptoms stable. And so the duration of treatment could be months to years. It's usually not shorter than that. So what are some of the pros and cons of ECP? Um, so one of the pros from a physician standpoint is that when we're adding on treatments for patients with graft-versus-host disease, we want to be really careful and thoughtful about um, the risks of infection because almost every treatment for GVHD affects the immune system in some way that will make a patient more susceptible to infection. And ECP as a procedure is not very immunosuppressive. Um, it definitely affects the way that our immune cells function, as, as I've explained, um, but it doesn't tend to um, be associated with many additional infections. And so when we want to add it to other treatments or substitute, other, substitute it for other treatments, we don't worry quite as much about immunosuppression. It also doesn't decrease patient's blood counts. So the red cells, white cells, and platelets should remain about the same, um, with the exception of some very tiny drops that can occur with the procedure itself. So in comparison to other treatments, some of the treatments for graft versus disease might affect uh, counts significantly, or a patient may be struggling with poor engraftment where their blood counts are not too high, and it, it will not, those counts will not take a hit from going through ECP. Um, kind of like I talked about before with low risk of infection, it's easy to add to other treatments. So there aren't any you know, drug-drug interactions that we need to think about or timing. If it's a pill, when do you take the pill compared to other things? Um, it doesn't add to anyone's pill burden uh, because it's related to, it's given through the IV. Um, so it, it can be added on fairly easily without worrying about interactions with other treatments. And it can also be given in or out of the hospital. And by that, I mean, if a patient comes in very sick and they're inpatient and they're admitted to the hospital, it can be started um, right then, at least in our center, it can. We can do ECP for patients who are hospitalized. Um, once the patients are discharged, we can then give the ECP um, in an outpatient setting. So out of the hospital just means out of an outpatient setting. It doesn't mean at home. They still have to come to our infusion center and get their treatment there. But it's something that can be initiated in the hospital and then carried through to outpatient. Or if a patient is on ECP and they happen to get admitted for any particular reason, it can be continued inside the hospital, which is helpful for consistency. 
In terms of what are some of the drawbacks of ECP, um, it may be inconvenient depending on your schedule or your distance from your transplant center. So um, I, I I wrote maybe because I I was going to say that, that it just is inconvenient, but some people don't don't find it terribly inconvenient. They don't mind coming in for their twice a week, um, but many people do hesitate to start ECP because they know that it's going to be two days of their week every week for a long time. For patients who have smaller veins or more difficult IV access, they may need a dedicated port placed for ECP, which um, just introduces a a small but not zero risk of things like um, port infections or blood clots, things like that. It's another procedure to go through. Another drawback is that it can take time to work. Sometimes it's weeks to months before we're really have a great sense of whether it's helpful or not, um, and it may not be available at, at every transplant center. So who might benefit from ECP? Um, the patients that we consider for ECP should at least have moderate to severe symptoms of graft-versus-host disease. So if they have just mild symptoms that um, don't require what we call systemic steroids, like steroids that are pills or IV, if it's something that can be treated with topical treatments or local treatments, it's usually not something where ECP is needed. It's usually something where the symptoms are, are in our grading scale, considered to be moderate or severe. Um, in general, we also consider patients who have not fully responded to steroids. And that's because if we could use steroids successfully, then it's a lot easier most of the time than bringing in someone for such an extensive kind of involved treatment. So if we can get away with our usual therapy, then we would always do that first. Um, it's important that the patient has the right type of IV access. Um, again, if peripheral IVs don't work, they may need to have a port placed, and then there are pros and cons to that. Uh, they do have to meet the laboratory criteria for the procedure when they come in. And again, this is usually not a big issue. Um, but again, if someone's counts are low, we need to make sure that we can transfuse them to make the procedure safe. And then, of course, um, the ECP needs to be available at their center. So um, before I... As for questions, I just wanted to acknowledge um, the support at our center. The director of the cell therapy program at Sidman is Dr. Von Bessin. Um, my GVHD clinic could not function without Linda Baer, the nurse practitioner that I work with. And then this is a picture of um, some of our fantastic apheresis nurses in our apheresis center, and of course, the patients and their caregivers. And I would be happy to take questions. Thank you, uh, Dr. Galipi, for this excellent presentation. Uh, right now, we're going to go into the uh, question and answer session. Mm -hmm. if, uh, if anybody has a question, uh, please use the chat box on the left side of the screen to submit your question. We'll get to as many as possible. So we have some in there already. And the first question is, what is the success rate of patients who have had ECP? Uh, doctors are arranging uh, for me to have this treatment as I have chronic TBHD. Uh, my skin, my arms are very tight and painful. I've been doing two other infusions to help it, but not, not seeing results in a timely manner. Okay, yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's a difficult one to answer. Um, I think the hardest question to answer about ECP is how likely it is to work. And I, I, and I think that's because um, I, I try to make all my predictions based on, on data. And it, like we kind of talked about, the publications are, are um, all have a little bit of their limitations. But what I would say from, you know, from the literature that's available and, um, you know, my own experience and our center's experience, I would say probably odds are that there will be a response. Um, but I know it, it sounds like it's um, probably hard to wait because the symptoms are so bothersome and, and you know, I'm not sure what, uh, you know, how much time has been allowed for the other treatments, but it definitely could take um, a couple of weeks, even a couple of months to really know for sure. So I would recommend um, giving it its best shot by, you know, trying for at least a couple of months um, before deciding that it may not be uh, successful. And I, I absolutely, truly do hope that it is. Thank you. Um, what what research is going on regarding ECP and lung GBHD? 
I'm not aware of any active trials that are being done um, locally. I don't know if there might be something focused on lung GVHD and ECP, um, you know, maybe nationally or internationally. I think it's a really good question because lung GVHD is so challenging to treat. And among all of the treatments for graft-versus-host disease, it tends to be the organ that responds the least um, out of almost anything else. And so it's you're definitely highlighting a really important challenge. Um, I do know, and it's sort of interesting to think about, um, we do do ECP in our center for patients who have had lung transplants and they're, they're undergoing rejection of their transplant through, um, you know, which is a completely different situation, but we know that in those patients there can be some benefit. And so um, the, what that has in common with lung GVHD is an, it's involving inflammation in the lungs by one immune system against another organ. So it's it's encouraging to know that that there's some role there um, and that it can be effective there. Um, it also, I think, highlights the fact that we don't have a lot of studies that will take one organ and look at all the different ways you could treat that organ with our graft versus host disease. You know, we have a lot of studies that are centered on what is the treatment. And then we put all the GVHD patients who are all very different from each other kind of into that same um, group. And so I think that it can be very hard to to know what is best for each organ that's affected when we're looking at these large groups and, and it's not based on the organ itself. Um, but it's something that I could certainly look into um, to see if there are any any active studies that I may, I may not be aware of. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, next question is, what are the factors that influence the use of a port uh, versus IV access? So um, usually it's based on whether um, an IV is easily placed. So if you need an IV for, you know, IV fluid infusion or something like that, um, if in general it's really uncomfortable or difficult to get that IV placed, then most likely um, it will be uncomfortable or difficult to get the IV placed for ECP. We do um, a dedicated vein assessment um, prior to starting ECP where our apheresis nurses will evaluate a patient, you know, examine their veins and try to determine whether a port is needed. We try whenever we can to not use a port, um, but I would say that a majority of the time um, patients do end up needing one, which is probably just because their veins have been accessed so many times for so many reasons by that point. Um, occasionally, someone will start use without a port, but after a couple of treatments, um, you know, they find that it's getting harder and harder and that they do need a port. So it's really just based on how easy is it to start an IV, and then does that change over time? Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that uh, ECP is kind of like uh, the third line of, of treatment after the second line of uh, drugs like what makes what makes them, uh, either fail or aren't effective anymore. Um, are those drugs stopped before you go into ECP treatment or are they used together sometimes? That's a great question. So um, usually, so they can be for sure continued um, and there's different ways to to handle that situation. So if we feel that those medications have not worked well then and we want to add ECP, um, there's sort of two ways to do that. One is just start the ECP and then taper that drug down or at least give the ECP a little bit of a chance to work before that drug goes away. That might be done in a situation where the patient is tolerating the drug fine, but we're just not so sure if it's working. And that way, we let the ECP take over, we let the ECP help the patient, you know, and then we feel more safe and comfortable taking away the other medicine. In other situations, if we think that one of the second line medications um, either was harmful or is very difficult to tolerate, or maybe it was only given for a short time and and we decided that you know, there was a reason that it couldn't be continued, maybe a safety reason or a tolerability reason, then we kind of want to just take that off quickly and switch to ECP. So I think, you know, what I'm saying is that when we're not sure how helpful the second line treatment has been, we tend to keep it on to be on the safe side until we know ECP is working and then we kind of 
try to sneak it away and have the body not notice. But if that second line treatment is is something that we feel we really need to get someone off quickly for safety reasons, then we might do that faster. And it's okay to continue, um, you know, if someone's on a second line treatment that we think is helping, but maybe say it helped in, you know, some organs, but not another, we may just add the ECP to try to get to that other organ. And, and again, um, kind of like we talked about, there's usually not much additional toxicity when you add ECP on top of, of something that, that you're already getting. So it doesn't tend to add a lot of, of increased uh, medical risk. Thank you. Okay, next question. Uh, what are the factors that help making the decision for when to lead off of ECP? Great question. Um, so one would be, is it working? So if a patient has been on for, I, you know, I'll usually give a couple of months before I try to make a determination if it's helping or not. Um, if there's really no change in someone's symptoms and it's been at least a few months, then I, it's really a risk-benefit question. Am, am I really helping someone by suggesting that they go through this when after a couple of months we're not seeing any improvement. So one would be just a lack of improvement. That would be one reason to think about just stopping. Um, another would be if someone has improved and stabilized then for a while. So the moment they improve probably isn't the time that you want to back off on the treatment, just like anything else that we um, you know, combine together for graft versus host disease. Um, once someone has improved, we usually try to keep them on for a while to make sure symptoms are truly stable and better, and then start to slow down after that. We have a um, um, a standard operating procedure for our ECP um, about when to think about um, tapering down, and it could be it's probably different for you know for every center, but it's sort of like a helpful reminder. Um, hey, don't forget to to taper down if, um, you know, if, if things are, are, are working well. Um, I'm just trying to look at it right now to see if I can find it because I have it pulled up in front of me. Um, but I, do, I don't see it right in front of me. And it probably does vary. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. So it's we give four months to um, sort of declare a response. Um, and then if at four months we're not seeing an improvement, then we will uh, then we will start to taper. So I think uh, – and another, another uh, factor could be tolerance. So for some reason, it's, um, it's difficult to tolerate. It becomes inconvenient or impossible to come in. If there's an issue with a port or the IV access, you know, that could be another reason to decide to taper down. So either, I guess in a nutshell, it's if we're worried that there is no response, if there's a, if there has been an adequate response and we think it's held on for enough time, or if there's a practical reason that we can't continue. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> next question, kind of a follow up. Um, I've been doing ECP for over a year, along with uh, Resurac. In the last few months, I've had increased tightness and dimpling in my fascia. Is there a point where ECP starts losing efficiency and it's time to move on to something else? That's also a great question. Um, I think that and just like any other intervention, um, there can be um, a point where uh, an intervention doesn't help as much anymore. So um, just like a medication or something like that, you know, the efficacy can change. So yes, it's possible to have um, basically graft-versus-host disease progressing despite being on a treatment that has worked well for a period of time. So I think when we think about it on our side, we we kind of blame the graft-versus-host disease more than a failure of the treatment. But I guess, that, you know, the answer is yes. So unfortunately for graft-versus-host disease, uh, one of the reasons it's so tricky is that it can sort of find ways to progress when, you know, we feel like we're doing everything right. We feel like we're doing everything we can. So, um, unfortunately, um, it will be possible to still have some progression. And then your doctor can sort of figure out with you, um, you know, how to handle that. Do you want to take something away? Do you want to add something? Um, if you do take something away, which one, you know, which one would you pick? Um, and what the strategy should be moving forward. Thank you. Um, next question. 
Can you speak more about uh, a special port? In the past, I required heparin because of a DVT from the hip line. Does the special port also run the same risk of uh, DVT? Uh, yes, unfortunately. So the risk is very low, um, but is not zero. So any port that is put into your body is associated with some small risk of clot or infection. Thank you. Um, next question is, with the damage to DNA cells that are returned to the body, does that increase the risk of developing secondary blood cancers or anything like that? That's a really good question. And I, I actually, as I said it, I, I felt a little bad. I, I'm prob it's probably, you know, more than just damaging the, the DNA itself in the cells. Um, there's a variety of organelles and, and other parts of the cell that can be injured, but but still, you know, to address your question specifically, not that we know of. Um, it's a really it's a really great question. I think what happens to most of the cells um after they uh go through that that process and that damage is most of them end up dying. And something I think is really interesting about ECP is that um, it's not just that we take out these these actively inflammatory cells and just kill them and leave them outside the body. It's not like we're just removing them, but somehow giving back these dying cells is sending some kind of a signal you know, to the rest of the immune system to just settle down. And I almost think of it like um, you know, you're bringing back wounded soldiers and the, um, and the donor's T cells look at all these wounded soldiers and they think, oh my gosh, we got we to gotta back off. You know, we're, we're getting beaten. You know, and then everything sort of settles. So there's no association um, that has been uh, published or um, at least to my knowledge that I'm aware of, um, of any kind of secondary cancers. But I do think it's very interesting that, you know, the damage tends to just kill the cell, but then once the cell comes back in, that's what really tells the body that it needs to, to change its strategy. Thank you. Um, next question, does ECP increase the risk of skin cancer um, because of the sorlimine component? Um, not that, again, not that I'm aware of, I'm not aware of any, um, associated risks of, of cancer. I think probably the, the reason that it would not be affecting, um, the skin would be that, that methoxysorlin, um, is only affecting the, the blood cells in the circulation. And as long as they're, you know, I don't, um, I don't think that that circulating blood is, is, reaching the skin. But again, um, no reports that I am aware of in terms of secondary malignancy. Um, but based on the number of questions, I can, um, I'd be happy to look into that a little bit more because it's making me curious. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. I receive ECP uh, twice a week for over 30 treatments now, and I have uh, severe pulmonary PBHD. Can I ask about having weekly treatments? Ask about having, I'm sorry, what was the last part of the question? Can I ask about having weekly treatments? Yeah. Weekly instead of twice a week? Yes, that's what the question okay. says. Yeah. Um, if, the, if it's helping, then going to down from twice a week to weekly uh, is reasonable. If it's not helping, then I then probably doing less would not be helpful. So I I'm I'm not I'm not sure if I caught that detail, but um, that that would be my answer based on the information that okay. is given. Okay. Uh, what is the, the? I know you touched on this a bit. What is the average length in time for treatments in months and years? I'm sorry, what's the average what in months and years? Average length in time that you're in ECP treatment. Oh, okay. Oh, boy. Um, I would just go on my own experience. I don't know if there's a study about that. So I would just have to say that overall, I would say most of our patients um, would be in the six months to a year range with a few being less, usually because 
we either decide it's not working or the patient can't continue for a particular reason. Um, there aren't many who do it for more than a year. So I think that's my that's my best average based on my own experience. Okay, thanks. Um, two more questions. Uh, the first one is, do you have knowledge of patients with AML, extramal, uh, urinary sarcomas being actively treated with uh, azactinine and ventoclax, and what are the issues? Do I have experience with patients with AML and an extramedullary sarcoma being treated with azacitidine and venetoclax? That's the question. Is that the question? Um, I'm thinking. I don't think that I do personally, um, but if if that person wants to contact me um, and they have a question that I can help with, I might be able to direct them to someone. Who can? It sort of depends on what the question is, because okay. it doesn't sound like it's maybe a graph versus host question or an ECP question, but um, but I'm happy to try to help find the answer to the question. Do you do okay. you guys get contact information for me? Because yes, we know we know. Yeah. Graphs. Okay. Yeah. So by all means, um, I'll help if I can. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Um, is uh, ECP ECP uh, currently being approved by Insurance, is it still on test and other new studies going on? So, yes, it is approved by insurance. I don't think I've had any trouble getting insurance approval for patients, um, whether it's for acute or chronic graft versus host disease. There's still some um, trials being done on ECP, but not. it's not an area where there are very many active trials uh, at any given time. And I, I don't know the answer exactly why that would be, except that most patients and centers probably prefer a treatment that's a little bit easier to administer and a little bit better understood. Um, and ECP is probably like the most involved and inconvenient treatment that exists. And so um, it's not one that we're really pushing a lot to figure out how, how we can make it, um, you know, how we could maybe uh, optimize it. Because at the end of the day, you know, we probably most people would probably rather have you know a pill or an infusion or something like that. So um, yes, there are a few studies um, that that are open at any given time, but I wouldn't say it's an area of, of extremely active investigation right now. Okay, um, I have a follow up question. Um, uh, the question is, I get ECP twice every other week. Should I get treatments every week as opposed to the we asked before? You know, I'm not I'm not familiar with data for that schedule. Um, it's not a schedule that we do here. It doesn't mean it's wrong by any means. It could be that institution standard of care. Um, so I guess I I don't know if if it is working. I would say stick with what's working. If it seems like it may not be working as well as as you'd like, then that would be something to to discuss with your doctor whether, you know, changing the, the frequency might make things a little bit better. Okay, thanks. Um, one more question from in. I have severe uh, GVHD in my lungs. Uh, high doses of prednisone has not worked. Uh, I tried uh, prick, but that did not work as well. Do you think photophoresis could help? Um, it's possible. Um, again, what's tricky with, with I mean, lung GVHD is so, it's so challenging and I really just want to respect that. Um, I, we've definitely had situations where, um, patients with lung graft versus host disease have uh, responded to ECP. There's a meta-analysis that I'm just pulling up right now. Meta-analysis is, um, a study that tries to take all the studies that exist and pull together the results to try to make it a little bit more predictive um, for most people. Um, in that meta-analysis, the response rate in lung GVHD was close to 50%, but I have to say that in my own experience, it's not been quite that good. Um, I would say that it's certainly worth considering, uh, especially if other things have not helped. Um, 
and maybe again, depending a little bit on what you've you know, already tried and and what other options there are, you know, if there's something that seems like it has a greater likelihood of helping, you know, maybe go for that first. Um, but it's not unreasonable to consider it. I certainly wouldn't rule it out to say, you know, the response rate is not fantastic, but it's not zero either. So I would say I would definitely keep it on the list of things to consider. Okay, thank you. Uh, that was our last question. Um, do you have anything else you'd like to add? I just want to thank everyone for for being here and the questions that you asked. I made a couple of notes um, to see if I can follow up on some of the questions and um, hopefully get get you guys a little bit better answers to some of them. Well, thank you. <clears throat> well, on behalf of uh, the MT Infonet and our partners, I'd like to thank Dr. Demokli for a very helpful and interesting presentation. Thank you. Infinite, if we can help you in any way. Uh, and please enjoy the rest of our symposium. Thank you very much. <laughs>